morning, everybody. I would like to thank Stephen for inviting me uh, to speak here. And I'll be speaking about hemodynamic and neurophysiological measurements of spontaneous activity and resting state functional connectivity. My lab at the MNI and McGill, MNI Brain Imaging Center, investigates mechanism underlying non-invasively obtained brain imaging signals, mechanisms and analysis methods of resting state functional connectivity, and the function of the visual cortex. So it's probably you know, not surprising that when I got the email from Stephen, title for your talk at Evolution and Function of Consciousness, I replied, dear Stephen, I feel that my current research is more on mechanism and processing and less related to consciousness. However, uh, looking a little bit more into it, uh, and again, maybe not surprisingly, because this is the brain after all, I found that there are some links between what I do in my lab, sometimes in anesthetized animals, and consciousness. And I'll try to mention them. So it's not going to be a pure consciousness talk for sure. It will be more mechanism, but there are some ties to consciousness. So other topics that are pursued in the study of brain and behavior usually probe the active brain. My talk surrounds the resting brain. And the main theme is, when no task is pursued, is brain activity random? Now, how can this be linked to consciousness? Uh, well, an obvious way is to ask, what's the role of non-random spontaneous activity? Which processor does it support? Possibly consciousness. And here is the overview of what I'll be speaking about. Uh, the first two items uh, are uh, tangentially linked to, co to resting state, not uh, directly, but I will use this data for the resting state talk. The first one is about the default mode network. The second one is, does negative fMRI response reflect decreased neurophysiological activity? Then I will define what is fMRI-based functional connectivity and resting state network, and I will ask, do fMRI measured resting state fluctuations reflect fluctuations in neurophysiological activity? I believe that was the first question after Wolf Zinger's talk last week. I will then uh, show that the default mode and dosal attention networks are anti-correlated. I will talk about the correspondence of the brain functional architecture during activation and rest, and on multi-scale hierarchy of resting state networks, specifically cortical columns and layers. Last, I will mainly speculate about the importance and functional role of resting state functional connectivity. So we'll start with the default mode network. And this comprises regions of brain that are regularly observed to decrease their activity during attention-demanding cognitive tasks. First reported by Schulman et al. in 97, we can see here a meta-analysis, simply analysis of very many PET studies in response, response measured by PET cerebral blood flow in response to nine different visual tasks. And all these areas that are highlighted here show decreased activity from baseline when a visual task is presented to the subject. In each of the studies, the subject processed a particular visual image and task state and viewed it passively, okay? And there, are, there is a network of areas that decrease their activity. This triggered a farther on studies, an hypothesis on the role of the so-called default mode network because it is more active in the baseline control state. It was named the default mode network, the network which is active when the brain does nothing. That's the default state. So hypothesis on the role of the default mode network. Self-referential processes, right, related to consciousness. Introspection, 
ongoing conscious and awareness. This was mainly suggested by a study that showed altered default mode network activity in sleep back in 2009. Uh, interestingly, uh, one can observe altered default mode network activity in mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, depression, and at least part of these diseases were mentioned earlier uh, over the last two weeks. So we mention by definition of the uh, default mode network that these are regions of brain regularly observed to decrease their activity during attention demanding cognitive task. However, is PET capable of reflecting by decreases in cerebral blood flow, decreased neuronal activity? Or possibly is it an artifact? Why? Because PET signal is an indirect measure of neuronal activity. When this subject viewed the stimulus, there were some processes of changes in neuronal activity relative to baseline uh, in the brains that caused some changes in cerebral blood flow that were, uh, were measured by PET in this case. However, since PET is only an indirect measure of changes in neuro neurophysiological activity, it would be very helpful to learn whether PET is indeed capable of uh, measuring this phenomenon. Why? Because it may be the case that increases in neuronal activity in some of the areas in response to the visual task increases cerebral blood flow to these areas, and therefore, via vascular phenomena, tubing phenomena, we can observe cerebral blood flow decreases in the so-called default mode network. However, an alternative is that changes in neuronal activity, either directly or indirectly, not necessarily by direct circuitry here, but just the task itself, causes decreases neuronal activity in the default mode network that cause decreases in cerebral blood flow. And obviously, distinguishing between these two possibilities is important. In order to address that question, um, I measured in the laboratory of Nikos Logothetis in Germany a functional MRI simultaneously with neurophysiology, not in the default mode network, but more in a model of the visual system that I expected would cause decreases in neurophysiology. So here is the paradigm here. Uh, that's the monkey brain. We see a chamber attached to the operculum, to the visual cortex of the monkey, and the electrode here, a shade of the electrode can be seen right here. The green arrow here points to the position of the tip of the electrode in monkey V1. We use two types of stimuli, one type overlapped with the receptive field, and the other type did not overlap with the receptive field. As you can see here, near the electrode, the overlapping stimulus induced positive blood oxygenation response, which we didn't measure directly in this experiment, but it is known that uh, increases in bold are related to increases in cerebral blood flow, which is measured by PET. And the non-overlapping stimulus uh, induced negative bold, negative blood oxygenation response near the electrode. We then drew a region of interest around the electrode in gray matter and sampled the bold response. And this is now meta-analysis over 15 sessions from nine monkeys. Uh, the overlapping stimulus induced increases, a positive bold response as expected, and the non-overlapping stimulus induced decrease in bold response, transient one. A bold response then, or bold signal then, a approach baseline, never reach baseline, and at the cessation of the stimulus, it showed an overshoot, as if disinhibition, a phenomenon which is called by neurophysiologists a disinhibition. So let's see what the neurophysiology did, and I want to mention that this is the best case scenario. Not all the experiments look like that. Uh, the, the overlapping stimulus showed, as expected, increases in neurophysiological activity, 
the non-overlapping stimulus-induced transient decreases in neuronal activity that approach baseline, never reached it, and then at the cessation of the stimulus showed a disinhibition a phenomenon. Uh, so the two time courses are similar, indicating that the negative ball response, at least in part, is associated with decreases in neurophysiological activity, not only in local field potential, but also in action potentials. So in the negative bold area, we got decreases in neuronal activity supporting the hypothesis or the notion that the decreases in the default mode network, the decreases in PET and later on functional MRI signal are associated with decreases in neurophysiological activity. So this is real. There is a network in the brain that decreases its activity it's active mainly in the default state, and it decreases its activity upon attentional demanding task, uh, which is introduced to the subject. So we move on to definition of fMRI-based functional connectivity and resting state networks, which, is, uh, which brings us to the main topic of uh, the talk today. Spontaneous fluctuations in fMRI signal. So if we introduce a subject, a human subject, to an MRI scanner and we measure blood oxygenation, functional MRI, we request the subject to do nothing, to have his eyes either closed or open. It doesn't matter very much. Most people use uh, closed eyes uh, in darkness or in dim light. And we do the exercise of introducing an ROI, a region of interest, in this case, in the somatomotor cortex, and we sample the functional MRI signal at rest. There is no task here, there's no stimulus, just as rest. We can see uh, fluctuations that seem pretty chaotic, large amplitude fluctuations in resting state in human cerebral cortex, a phenomenon that was first described by Biswal et al., 95, and then there are many researchers that investigate this phenomenon this way. Note that there is, a, or these fluctuations are of slow temporal scale, from 0.01 to 0.1 hertz. So each cycle is either 10 seconds or slower. So we're not talking here about fluctuations in fast neurophysiology signal. We're talking about really very slow fluctuations. Now, this was spontaneous activity measured by functional MRI, but we are actually interested in the so-called functional connectivity. In order to do that, we will uh, use the time course that we introduced here from the region of interest, from the somatomotor cortex, and we will pursue a so-called seed-based correlation. What it means is that we will take this time course and we will check for all voxels in the brain which are the voxels that show similar fluctuations that you know seem to not have any order, but are there any voxels in the brain that show similar fluctuations? And here is an example of uh, the yellow in this case. Colors here are a little bit confusing. The pink is from the left somatomotor cortex, the yellow is from the right somatomotor cortex. So in the other hemisphere, in the contralateral hemisphere, uh, there are regions in a homologous area, somatomotor cortex, that seem to show pretty much the same fluctuations. There are cortical and subcortical regions that show similar time courses that form the so-called somatomotor cortex. In this case, uh, as we mentioned, it's the right somatomotor cortex, S2 in the left one, um, and the thalamus and the cerebellum. Pretty remote areas, they fluctuate together, and when they do, we define them, we say that they form a resting state network, one resting state network. As a measure of similarity, a simple measure of similarity, one can use simply correlate, Pearson correlation coefficient, that shows linearity. If the two signals are linear, not necessarily with the same amplitude, just linear, then the Pearson correlation coefficient would be one. 
if they are anti-correlated again, with no relation to changes in amplitude, it would be minus one. And you can see that there is a progression of a, the measurement or the measure of a Pearson correlation coefficient in relation to how linear the two signals are uh, with each other. Uh, these days, there are much more uh, sophisticated methods to measure uh, resting state functional connectivity. I bring this as a simple example just to mention that similarity of time courses can be quantified. So we used, a, or we can use, seed-based correlation and define the human somatomotor resting state network. However, just like in the case of the negative ball response and the default mode network, are these signals real? real? Are these similarities real? Again, there may be some spontaneous uh, changes in your physiological activity. Can everybody hear me in the back? Sorry? All right, try to suppress the noise and focus on my talk. <laughs> so again, bold fMRI is an indirect measure of neurophysiological activity. And so, you know, the fact that we see similar time courses of bold functional MRI at rest does not mean that they really reflect neurophysiological activity, fluctuations in neurophysiological activity. So we need to address the question of whether resting state fMRI fluctuations reflect fluctuations at the neurophysiological level, right? Is what BSWAL measured, does it reflect changes in neurophysiology? Why is this important? Because, as we mentioned, BOLD or PET are indirect measure of neurophysiological activity and part of the resting state fluctuations and correlations could be subject of movement, a MRI noise, a, or physiological noise origin. Okay, the, the origin could be an artifact, in fact, as was shown many times. And here is just one example of bold signal correlated with respiration volume per time. Okay, if we have, if we measure simply by a belt around a uh, the chest of the subject, uh, how many uh, respirations does he pursue in a minute? And what's the volume of these respirations? We get slow fluctuations. Now we can use this uh, signal, which is a signal as a function of time, to correlate back with the fluctuations in fMRI signal. And then we can obtain a beautiful resting state network, right? So we need to be aware of these uh, issues and use whatever measurements that we can during uh, the measurement of resting state functional MRI and regress out these possible artifacts. Here's another demonstration of the same phenomenon. Again, you can see a very nice resting state network only uh, due to fluctuations in uh, the volume of respiration per time of the subject. So we need to verify whether after regression of all these artifactual uh, signals or sources, whether there is anything in the bold signal which still reflects fluctuations in neurophysiology. Uh, in order to do that, uh, David Yopold and I at the laboratory of Nikos Lokotetis obtained again measurements in the monkey visual cortex in spontaneous activity, measurements of functional MRI simultaneous with neurophysiology. We obtained data from nine sessions. In seven sessions, the anesthetized paralyzed monkeys viewed a grade image. In two other sessions, uh, the two monkeys were in complete darkness. We can see here again the chamber and the electrode in middle layers of V1. We do a region of interest in gray matter around the electrode, and uh, we sample the bolt signal. And that's how it looks, right? These are 30 seconds of fluctuations, there is no task, no visual stimulus here, so these are just random fluctuations, and these are associated with fast changes in neurophysiology that were recorded simultaneously. Now we need to bring these two measurements into the same temporal scale. The reason is that 
bold changes slowly and it is sampled in this case one volume per one second. While neurophysiology signal change very fast and are sampled in this case at 21 kilohertz. We need to bring them to a common temporal scale. In order to do that, we computed the spectrogram of the neurophysiological signal that was aligned to the measurement of each volume in functional MRI. So the spectrogram here shows a power as a function of frequency and time. A similar images were shown last week by Wolf Zinger and other researchers. And now we can take a, the spectrogram and integrate the power in the gamma domain or in the multi-unit activity domain to obtain, to obtain fluctuations at the temporal scale, fluctuations of overall neuro neurophysiological activity at a temporal a sampling a rate of one measurement per second aligned to the bold signal. We then can pursue cross-correlation of the spontaneous blood oxygenation signals with the spontaneous neurophysiological signals. Cross-correlation as a function of lag. In this case here, I show an example where a string of 15 seconds of bold signal is correlated with 15 seconds of neurophysiological signal with the lag of three seconds. Bold, lag behind, neurophysiological activity. At least that's what we expect from task-related uh, studies. So when we do that, we can show that spontaneous fluctuations in bold correlate with fluctuations in power of the broadband neurophysiological activity, right? So this is the cross-correlation function as a function of temporal lag, bold lagging behind neurophysiology, and we see that around a zero-second lag, there's no much correlation, but around five or six seconds, we can see a peak in the cross-correlation, which is statistically significant. And the overall shape of the cross-correlation looks like a so-called hemodynamic response function, which would be the bold response to one impulse, one very short neurophysiological uh, activity. And so we get here statistically significant correlation between bold and neurophysiology, suggesting that uh, even in the resting state, bold, at least in part, if we are careful and regress out all the artifacts, it reflects fluctuations in neurophysiological activity. Now, in order to make sure that this correlation is not due to false positive detection, we shuffled the time courses, we mixed the signal such that bold the neurophysiology was obtained from exactly the same data, but were not obtained simultaneously anymore. When we break the simultaneity condition, we see a flat cross-correlation function, suggesting that this correlation here is truly positive. Now, this is with the broadband neurophysiology signal. Uh, one can show the same phenomenon when looking at power in gamma activity, in, in the gamma band, uh, which is the main signal thought to be associated with changes in bold, at least in sensory areas. But also, we get the same uh, correlation in the multi-unit activity domain, reflecting mainly action potentials. And when we uh, uh, count the rate of action potentials uh, just spike by spike, we get the same phenomenon. Similar results were obtained uh, later on by a study of Chovnik et al, who replicated the, a most consist that the most consistent relationship between spontaneous fluctuations in bold signal and in neurophysiology were in the gamma domain. Uh, these authors also obtained or showed correlation uh, in lower frequencies, mainly alpha and below, but these, as we also saw in the anesthetized monkey, were not as consistent as in the gamma domain. Summary. Spontaneous fluctuations in fMRI signals in V1 correlate with the locally measured fluctuations in the underlying neuronal activity. Fluctuations in bold correlate with fluctuations in the local field potential, gamma activity, 
multi-unit activity and in spike rate. So question is, we know that they are now correlated locally, but is the gamma band limited power an adequate candidate to underlie fMRI resting state functional connectivity uh, in V1? Uh, in order to be a good candidate, it has to be correlated with the functional MRI signal over large distances because functional MRI or resting state uh, functional connectivity has been shown to show regions uh, that are correlated over very extended uh, regions, spatially. So are the gamma band limited power and resting state functional MRI signal correlated over a large extent in the visual cortex? So in order to demonstrate that, we will uh, show um, a little bit of an animation, spatiotemporal uh, correlation between voxel to voxel functional MRI signal in the resting state and neurophysiology measured in one location in V1 in the electrode. Uh, please note specificity of the correlation to gray matter region, okay, avoiding the white uh, matter here. Uh, again, uh, showing or suggesting very strongly that these correlations are of vascular origin and are related to neurophysiology in the gray matter and not in the white matter. So zero second lag, one second, uh, three seconds, five seconds, we see a peak of the correlation spatially and temporally, and then uh, the correlation uh, die out. Here is another experiment or another uh, case in which the electrode is in the middle of the operculum, and here I just show the peak where spatially extended regions uh, are associated, that show correlation with the gamma activity in, uh, measured in one position uh, in the electrode. I would like to emphasize that these data were obtained with a surface coil, and uh, largely speaking, correlations were found with neurophysiology in one position in V1, wherever the coil was sensitive enough to get bold signal. Here is another example with a little bit of a larger coil uh, obtained with uh, 30 continuous minutes of spontaneous activity in complete darkness. Uh, the electrode uh, is right here, and we see here extended correlations, uh, actually, in fact, in both hemispheres, uh, with neurophysiology in one side of V1. Why do I emphasize the two hemisphere? Because that's another indication that this is not only vascular. There are changes here, correlations in neurophysiology. The reason is that the arterial supply to the brain of the two hemispheres, the arterial supply to the two hemispheres is largely, largely independent with the last relation between the two hemispheres in terms of arterial supply in the circle of Willis, very much at the base of the brain. Uh, this also shows that functional connectivity in the resting state is mediated by polysynaptic pathway, possibly involving higher visual areas or the thalamus. The reason is that there are no direct connections in lower visual areas from one hemisphere to the other, except for a very narrow strip around the vertical meridian. So the neuronal and hemodynamic signals are correlated over large regions of the visual cortex. And this raises a, a question. We showed things relatively locally, right, with an ROI and also within the visual cortex, but uh, with one electrode. Does fMRI-based functional connectivity between remote regions, say in the case of left motor cortex and right motor cortex, reflects coherence between, between neuronal activities in these regions? So in order to address this question, we can build on the result that we obtained in V1, and by induction and association, it just indicates, it's not really a proof, but just indicate that probably this is the case. The reason is that uh, if we take now two areas, A1 and A2, hypothetical areas, that were shown in human functional MRI to be a functionally connected via bold signal, uh, we can... Uh, generalize, we assume that we can generalize the results from V1 to A1 and to A2, therefore A1 and A2 show fluctuations in bold locally that correlate with neurophysiology locally, then we say that functional MRI in humans shows resting state uh, functional connectivity between these two remote areas, 
And therefore, by induction or association, it, we can conclude that the two areas are connected only also at the neurophysiological level. So going back to our overview, we defined fMRI-based functional connectivity and resting state network, and we showed a case in which resting state fluctuations in bold correlate with slow fluctuations, very slow fluctuations in neurophysiological activity. We now move on to a different resting state network, not anymore the somatomotor or the visual cortex, but we go back to the default mode network. Remember, we defined it at the beginning of the talk based on decreases in fMRI signal to cognitive task, attention demanding task. It turns out that if we do the same exercise of taking a region of interest in the default mode network and seeing what happens during spontaneous activity, it does show as a resting state network. And what I will show here today, uh, which was actually initiated by Fox and Reichel in 2005, uh, is that the default mode network and another network, so-called dorsal attention network, are anti-correlated. Uh, I highlight this item in the overview in red because, again, I think that it touches a little bit about consciousness and the uh, introspection and the outer world in which we uh, function. So the human brain, that was the title of uh, the paper by Fox et al. Uh, back in 2005, the human brain is intrinsically organized into dynamic anti-correlated functional network, networks. So one network, again, in blue and green, is the, the resting state uh, default mode network, defined here, not with regard to decreases in activity in a task, All right, okay. So uh, uh, defined here as a resting state network, and the other one is a so-called dorsal attention network, which increases its activity whenever there is an attention-demanding task introduced to the subject. And they showed that in the resting state, during spontaneous activity, these two networks are uh, anti-correlated. They fluctuate between themselves, and of course, one uh, can come up here with hypothesis on the introspection and the outer world in spontaneous activity fluctuate, uh, interact with each other or against each other. Uh, so just to mention very briefly that the method that they used in order to show that included a subtraction of the global average signal shown to include show to induce spurious negative correlation. In other words, if you take the signal in the default mode network and in the dorsal attention network and you subtract the average between them, then you induce negative correlations, right? The, one of the areas is going to be negative. I'll mention quickly that we looked into an analysis method that overcame this problem uh, by using principal component analysis uh, into resting state functional MRI uh, time, co uh, courses, time series. And by using principal component analysis, we showed that the first principal component in virtually 95% of the cases captures the global effect, the same effect or a very similar effect to what Fox et al. subtracted. However, so this just shows that the PC that captures the global signal in most of the cases is the first PC with the large variance of the data. However, when one uh, subtracts or regresses out this principal component, uh, this doesn't induce artifactual negative correlations because principal components are orthogonal. Now, if we look at the original method of Fox and Raquel, we do see here the anti-correlated default mode and dorsal attention network. If we use our PC-based method, which does not introduce artifactual uh, anti-correlations, we get largely the same anti-correlation during the resting state, and therefore we can conclude 
that the resting state and the default and the resting state default mode and those are attention networks are indeed anti-correlated. Also, the resting state global fluctuations and network specific fluctuations are uncorrelated, supporting a resting state linear additive model, meaning there is a global activity, and on top of it, a, there, is a, there are signals that ride on it that are more resting state network specific. So we talked about the default mode and the dosal attention network. A very briefly about correspondence of the brain functional architecture during activation and rest. Uh, in order to address this question, uh, Smith et al. used the so-called the Tyler uh, coordinate system of the human brain. Uh, it's a, you know, a, a complicated uh, system, but really what it means or it, what it gives us is only a way, a means, uh, in order to register one brain of one subject to another subject, etc., etc., etc. So using a coordinate system, one can come up with a so-called database. In this case, it's a specific database called BrainMap, which includes data from almost 30,000 subjects where the researcher wrote or entered to the database the coordinate of all areas in the brain that showed increase in response to a certain task or stimulus, okay? So this is, it's a huge database, and the large numbers, even if a specific entries are not exact, the large numbers ensure that if we look at uh, all areas that respond in response to a visual stimulus in the left uh, visual field, uh, we'll show it in a very precise manner. What Smith et al. did uh, is to look into brain map coordinates from this database in response to certain tasks, such as visual or auditory, and relate them to resting state networks that they obtained from 36 subjects, okay? So already with this task, I'm not sure what it is, you can see that there is a similarity of a re one of the resting state networks on the left here, RSN, resting state network, to the areas that are active in response to a certain task. Looking at more, uh, about 10 networks that are usually mentioned in the literature, we can see again a correspondence of resting state networks to areas that are co-active, that co-activate uh, during task, which makes resting state, uh, of course, uh, more interesting and just shows again that resting state networks and functional connectivity shows uh, non-random processes in the human brain during spontaneous activity. Sorry? All right. Five minutes, okay. So uh, we show here, or Smith et al. showed, corresponses of the brain functional architecture during activation and rest. However, this is when looking at the brain at large scale, right? This is looking at the brain at a, the level or the scale of systems or maps or cortical areas. How about a finer scales? FMRI voxel, one FMRI voxel is somewhere between one centimeter and one millimeter between cortical maps and networks. We want to look at finer scales. Other resting state networks at the scale of neurons, or maybe a circuit, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. cortical columns, cortical layers. Uh, just to mention, these are three scales that are usually mentioned uh, in relation to studies of the brain. Uh, one is the macroscopic. I'll start with maybe the microscopic at the level of single cells, maybe uh, two, three cells, and the synapses between them. Mesoscopic, more at the level of a, a column or circuit and macro scale at the level of the entire brain. So what's going on at the level of the mesoscale, maybe at the micro scale, are there resting state functional networks that uh, can be uh, obtained at this level? Um, I'll skip some of the details. I'll just mention that I'll first present here a study by, uh, a study that used voltage sensitive dyes that uh, can measure 
resting state activity, both at a temporal scale, a very fine temporal scale of milliseconds, and at a very fine scale of uh, columns in the visual cortex here. So this is the visual cortical map for orientation in CAT area 18. So one can present different uh, visual stimuli of different orientations, and one get columns that are co-active in response to certain orientations. Right? And one can compute the vectorial summation to obtain the preferred orientation maps in the same area. Now, if we take, as Ariely et al. took, the response, the pattern of response to horizontal gratings, and now, during spontaneous activity, we look for patterns that are similar to the response to uh, horizontal gratings, then we can see with the correlation coefficient that sometimes, like in this case, the correlation coefficient is high, indicating that there is a pattern that at that very moment during spontaneous activity was very similar to the pattern of a horizontal map. And that's just uh, the statistics of it, showing that the distribution during spontaneous activity in red of correlation coefficients is wider than the correlation coefficient of a control, just showing that the phenomenon is statistically significant, uh, meaning that cortical maps emerge spontaneously more than is expected by chance about 15 to 20 percent of the time. Therefore, again, a non-random phenomenon at the level of cortical columns. And I'll just finish, or I'll uh, conclude, uh, with some ad additional data that we obtained recently showing that also the cortical columns or between layers in cortex, one can describe resting state functional connectivity and resting state networks that show non-random organization. So we used a laminar probe here. This is the rat brain, area S1FL, and we obtained local field potential. Uh, the frequency distribution, the power of uh, in certain frequencies uh, as a function of cortical layers is non-random, already showing some structure and non-randomness during spontaneous activity. But here is the main phenomenon I would like to talk about uh, in the delta, theta, alpha, beta, low gamma, and high gamma domain. If one computes the matrix of correlation between contacts that are uh, changing as a function of cortical depth, layer one, two, three, four, five, and six, one can show two main clusters, one in superficial layers, mainly in layer three, four, and five A, and the other in layer six, uh, the more deeper layer. Here we used a formal clustering to show that the main clusters in red and orange are in layer 3, 4, and 5A, and 6, respectively, with additional clusters emerging in layer 5B and in layer 1. So resting state functional connectivity can be observed at multiple functional spatial scales, including those of cortical columns and layers, and layer 3, five, three to 5A and 6 form two distinct clusters based on coherence of spontaneous local field potential. Um, I'll skip that. Uh, I will say some things, but um, somehow the role and the functions are not here, but we can discuss them, I guess, during the discussion. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, 